Welcome to the talk about permissionless DEXs. This talk is really intended as a systematization of knowledge. That means we will look at the most popular DEXs that are currently out there on Ethereum at the trading mechanisms. We will categorize them um, and color everything a little bit with some statistics. And right before I actually start, I want to gauge the audience just very quickly. Like, who of you knows what a permissionless exchange is? Put up your hands. Yeah, that's quite a few. Perfect. All right, and why are permissionless exchanges great? Yes, because they are one of the fundamental building bricks for our DeFi, right? So with that said, um, I would like to st show you the agenda. We will first give you a quick overview of what exactly was the current state of decentralized exchanges. Then we will look into the, all the different market mechanisms, categorize them a little bit, and then also have a future outlook what Gnosis is going to do with permissionless exchanges. So, uh, with permissionless exchanges, right. So let's start and by looking into the definitions. So, um, you can classify DEXs in two kind of categories, permissioned and permissionlesses. So the permissioned ones is, are the ones where some kind of the trading flow is actually permissioned. Usually it is by some operator who is sitting in between and matching orders. Because usually you have the following trading flow, that there are some traders, they're signing their orders, they're handing them over to the operator, and then the operator is matching them in real time, and s basically sends then the matched orders to some kind of blockchain over here, Ethereum, and then the settlement is happening in a non-custodial way. And this is a super efficient market mechanism, like IDEX, the market leader, is implementing it. Um, many of the relayers that are operating on 0x are doing it like this way, and we have also many projects in who are now looking into how we can actually do that in a very scalable way, and Loopring is, for example, one of them. But then we have also the permissionless DEXs. And over here, the orders that are basically sent in by the customers are matched by an algorithm in some kind of decentralized way. So you have basically usually this trading flow that you have these customers, they send the orders directly to the blockchain, which then functions as the data availability layer. And then over there, the, the orders are matched with some kind of algorithm. And yes, there are many cool projects out there that are facilitating these techniques. For example, Kyber, East to Die, Uniswap, and the Dutch X. Zero X, I put here kind of in the middle because actually protocol is permissionless, but most of the time it is used from relayers as something permission. And I also want to highlight, like, these are definitions that are being kind of formed these days. Other people like to call them a little bit different. For example, for permission, ex for permission DEXs, people like to call them operator-driven indexes because, yeah, the operator is one of the um, main um, points in there. And for the permissionless ones, some people say that permissionless, in order to, that an exchange is really permissionless, they, everything has to be permissionless, not just the trading flow. I'm just mentioning that because some of these protocols that I'm putting over there, they um, have some permission part, for example, adding a token. Okay, let's look at the tentative features that these kind of exchanges are offering. So the permission, the access, they usually have two pretty powerful features. And the first one is instant finality. If you're trusting your operator, then you basically can get instant finality because if you're trusting him that he will send the orders exactly in the order that he was intending to do it later on on the Ethereum chain and settles them over there, then you get instant finality and can do um, basically with this information trade somewhere else. Then also you can place basically all the orders off chain. That's super cool because with that adjusting orders is very cheap. But um, always, if you have this operator, then there is some trust involved. The operator could always front run. And with that, also, these kind of exchanges are likely to be more strictly regulated. On the other hand, um, for these permissionless exchanges, we have also cool features. And the first one is a, an atomic trade. What do I mean with that? Basically, if I'm sending out a transaction to some blockchain and this transaction first makes a trade on one DEX and then also on the other DEX, 
I can kind of encode this transaction so that either both trades are made on these stacks or none of the trades are made. And that's very powerful because with that you can basically uh, make trades without any risks if, you, if these trades are related to each other. And then, that is really exciting, these permissionless exchanges usually provide some liveness guarantees. That means if you want to build a protocol on top of some exchange that allows you to do some trades, with these permission exchanges, you really have the guarantee that not tomorrow something happens and then everything is shut down and stop. These protocols, they're really living on the blockchain of that, but they will be available. Right. So let's look at some statistics. So what are about the market shares? So over here, I've plotted the transaction count over the last 30 days, kind of the average. And we see definitely, hey, IDEX is the market leader, pretty dominant, with basically 50%. But then we have also Zero X has also lots of activity going on there. And we have Kyber, East to Die, Bancor, Delta, and Uniswap. And what do all they have in common? Well, they are permissionless exchanges. And we can really see, hey, actually permissionless exchanges are really having a significant um, share, roughly, I would say, one third. And the next chart is showing how, this, um, ex how these figures basically changed over time. So it starts basically from February to bas today. Um, these data were kind of collected with Dune Analytics, really cool tool. And yeah, it shows you basically that East to Die and Uniswap really gained some market share. That's pretty exciting. But overall, there's not, I would say, a dominant tendency that either the one or the other one will really gain more market share in the future. Right. So that was the rough overview. Let's look into the different market mechanisms. The first one, the very, um, the one which was kind of impl implemented first by Ether Delta, are simply on-chain order books. So how do they work? Like the customers are sending in some limit orders. Um, the orders have been basically stored on-chain. And then the order book looks something like this. This is from ETH today. And then the orders are basically matched with previously posted limit orders. And ETH today has also this cool feature that they are basically sorting all the orders with the price. And then basically, if you're putting in a market order, it is ensured that you will first match the limit orders that are out there with the highest price. Right, the advantages are definitely, hey, this is the continuous double auctions, that's the trading mechanism that was used in the traditional industry everywhere, and with that, it's very legitimate. And of course, as I mentioned, you can have these atomic trades. But the disadvantages are that there could be these racing conditions. So basically, imagine there's a, a very profitable limit order out there, and I want to basically trade against this limit order, I will send out my transaction with some um, pricing, for example, 20 G-Way, and then just anybody else can come in. I actually, I also want to have this match, uh, match with this limit order, and so he's sending just 25 G-Way, and then there starts this bidding, and that's what people call the priority gas auctions. Right, then we have also a very popular trading mechanism, which was kind of coined by Vitalik, the X times Y equals K markets. Probably most of you just know it as the Uniswap markets. So these markets are working with some function. Basically, if you want to trade token A against token B, then you have a function over there that the tokens A times the tokens B are always should always be equal to some variant. And that basically gives you then this curve over here. And now trading is super easy. The only rule is, all the time we have to stay on this curve. So basically, if you're starting over here and you want to buy, uh, if you want to spend eight, time, eight tokens, then you will get this amount of B tokens from it. Super easy, right? And this is um, used by Uniswap, but also Kyber has these automatic price reserves and they are basically implementing the same mechanism. It's not exactly like that. Right, Kyber is, definitely offering these automated um, price reserves, but they are also offering these Fed price reserves. It's also exciting. So these Fed price reserves are basically made with three parameters. Um, people need to maintain a price on-chain. 
they need to maintain a target token ratio. Basically, if you're trading tokens A against B, like how much of the tokens A and B should, in average, the token contract hold? And then they are measuring, basically, the difference of, hey, what is the target and how much tokens they actually have, and that's then the delta T. And how do they then calculate the prices for the customers? Well, the exchange rate for some volume S is then basically the price that is currently on-chain. Um, they multiply it with some function, which is slightly decreasing if the sell volume is bigger. And they are multiplying it with some function that takes into account basically the difference of th their target ratio and the ratio that they actually have from the tokens. Yes, these markets are super cool because they have this automatic order book adjustment. As you have seen it, like if there happens some trade, then simply the, cur the point on the curves are changing, and with that also the order book is automatically changed. You have this automatic trading, and one of the coolest features is definitely, hey, everyone can provide liquidity to um, these markets by simply doing deposits and then automatically gaining some, some portion of the fees. But the disadvantages are that these kind of order books are usually a little bit less expressive than limit order books. Another mechanism that was used also a lot during the ICO phase um, is basically the Dutch auction. It works like that, that you have a predefined amount of token that you want to sell, and you have a starting price of... Uh, um, and this starting price then decreases over time. And also, over time, we are collecting some bidding orders, and then exactly at this point where the sell volume divided by the buy volume actually mets the price, that's where we are then basically stopping it and really doing the exchange. Everyone is getting the same price um, for the tokens they are buying. Right, it was used, um, or it is used by the Dutch exchange built with Gnosis, but it's also used in many liquidation mechanisms. The advantage is definitely that it bundles the liquidity over time and it's really good for handling big sell orders. On the other hand, it has this huge disadvantage that the settlement um, is relatively slow. Now, I'm really excited about this mechanism. It's another auction mechanism. It's called the batch auctions. Um, it works roughly like this, that we are collecting limit orders over time Basically, you can see over here the blue line is the limit orders. I want to buy token A, I want to buy token B for token A, and the orange ones is kind of the inverse trade. And we're collecting these over time, and then at some point, after some minutes, we are closing the batch, and then we have a usual order book, but the order book is kind of overlapping. And now, for this overlapping order book, we want to calculate the optimal price. That's exactly there where the um, order books are meeting, because this price will basically allow the highest trading volume for the market to be matched. Right. And once we have this optimal price, um, we can settle all orders exactly with that price. And with that, we think we have a very fair price volume. And the cool thing about this market mechanism is that you can combine it with ring trades. What is the ring trade? Imagine we have over here these three tokens, A, B, and C, and you have, let's imagine you have only a sell order from A to B, but not the inverse one, then usually you couldn't do any trade. But if it also happens that you have an order from B to C and an order from C to A, and if these actually then match up with prices and volumes, then you can actually settle the complete ring. And that's pretty cool. That helps especially in fragmented um, liquidity situations a lot that you're basically just closing a ring and by that get further liquidity. So if you're considering batch, auctions and ring trades, if they're combined very well, you get kind of the following advantages. Definitely, you can also bundle liquidity over time. We do not really have front running because we can do this price finding in a very decentralized way, so there's not really an operator. And also, basically, because all the limit orders are not matched at the limit price, but at a price that is later on calculated, the front running issue with gas auction is also pretty much eliminated. And, of course, it allows these ring trades, which will provide more liquidity. But the downsides are a little bit that, hey, we have a little bit slower finality, like just some minutes. And also with that, arbitrage is always a little bit riskier. 
Right, so these were basically all the permissionless exchanges mechanism that I quickly wanted to show. And here is one more time basically how a permissioned exchange or an operator-driven exchange works. It's basically the following way that, hey, we have our customers, customers over here. They are signing with their private keys um, their orders. These orders are then sent to the operator. The operator is doing the actual matching and sends these matched orders to the Ethereum chain. And now the Ethereum chain is verifying all the signatures that were previously given by the customers, and with that basically settles everything in a non-custodial way. So I know probably this was all a lot of information, but I've summed it up for you guys over here. So this is the feature matrix of many exchanges that are out there. On the left-hand side, you see many of the features we were just talking about, and on the top, definitely, you see the exchanges. Let's walk through these features again, one to one. Um, and why when let's look at instant finality and atomic trades. What you can really see is, hey, usually you have only the one or the other thing. Like there is no exchange that basically offers both. If you look at the front running situation regarding the gas auctions and the operator ones, it's kind of the same thing. Also, you can either have the one or the other, although there are some exemptions. I want to mention over here that also Uniswap and Kyber and also Isudai have kind of found ways around these gas auctions, especially if they allow the customers to define a minimal slippage, then it's not so easy front runnable. It's just these gas auctions still occur if the market price drops um, also in other exchanges, and then people want to bid very quickly in order to meet still the good limit prices on the uh, exchange. Right. Um, the batch auctions, as I mentioned before, they are not so easy to be front run. And then we have the next feature, the ring trades. These ring trades, they can be included either in these batch auctions very easily, or Loopring, another very cool project. Um, it's also trying to incorporate them in a usual limit order book exchange. Right, Tex, I have not yet mentioned too much, but it's also a very exciting project which tries to eliminate, although they have an order book limit model, they try to eliminate the front running by the operator by basically dealing with encrypted um, orders, and the orders are encrypted with a cool scheme quite similar to the VDF mechanism. And I think that all of these exchanges are basically scalable with some technologies used in the Rolla project, with some zero-knowledge technologies. Um, it's just that for these projects over here, we know that people are actively working on that, That's, and over here I was not aware, that's why they didn't get the green hook over there. Right, so this was kind of the overview, and now I quickly want to talk about what Gnosis is working on. So we are really excited about these batch auctions because they have these cool features over here. They're not easy to be front-running, and what we're gonna build with that is the Fusion POC. It should allow people to convert very cheaply stable coins from the one coin to the other one. So currently, the stablecoin market is really fragmented, and we think, especially with ring trades, we can change the situation over here and really build an exchange that offers very low slippage. So how are we going to do that? We're going to do that with these batch auctions, but just a little bit different. So what we're going to do, we will offer customers to place um, limit orders between any two stable tokens, and we are collecting them over predefined time, probably something about five minutes. And then we want to calculate in a very decentralized way the uniform clearing prices. That's how we are calling them. These are very special prices. These prices, as in the usual batch auctions, should maximize the trading volume. Of course, um, the trading volume only for orders that respected the limit price. The prices should be coherent. They should be arbitrage-free. That means if I'm looking at the prices over here from B to C, I should get exactly the same price as if I did the ring trade over here, um, this way. So basically from C to A, from A, A to C. 
And of course, they should preserve value, meaning the same amount of tokens is bought and sold per token in each auction. So I know this is not easily to understand and visualize, but we tried it over here. Imagine, now we have collecting, we have collected all the different orders between the different stable coins, and we are basically getting between of these, for each of these token pairs, we are getting these overlapping um, order books. And now, how do we solve this optimization problem? Basically, what we are doing, we are mapping these order books in the, into a multi-dimensional space where the axes are basically the prices, and then each dot over there represents a set of prices that is arbitrary, and then we are checking how much volume can we actually match with exactly these prices. And then we are very interested in the ones that generate the most trading volume because they will execute all ring trades at the best possible price. So for our diffusion POC, this will have the following advantages. Definitely, we will be much easier in handling all the fragmented liquidity with these ring trades. The sellers and the buyers liquidity is bundled again over time that really facilitates matching between sellers and buyers. And also we have a cool feature that basically allows us to onboard liquidity quite similar as the Uniswap protocol. Right, if you're excited about these things, um, let me know, <laughs> um, talk to me. Also, I want to mention that the Gecko ecosystem will provide a challenge on finding very quickly these optimal prices. It's also very exciting if you want to be involved, um, just follow it. And yeah, with that, I would like to thank you all for your attention, and of course, I want to thank the team that is working on this cool project. Thanks, Alex. Uh, we have time for some questions. Yes. Yes, over here. Thank you for the great presentation. Uh, you mentioned front-running problem, like guess action front-running, but we actually have also minor front-running problem. So malicious miner can insert his, their own transaction into batches before execution of uh, traders' transactions. So, do we have effective mechanism of preventing it for on-chain uh, order books or XYK markets? Sorry, sorry, I did not understand it completely. So, you were talking about front, uh, front running by miners. Yes. Until there, I get it. Okay, and then, what is then the question? Sorry, I didn't understand it. Uh, so, do we have a mechanism for preventing that malicious behavior from miners? Some kind of algorithmic protection of fairness? I am not aware of an algorithmic protection over there, no. I think, yes, currently, like, miners are not yet front-running um, these things. What we are seeing, basically, is are these priority gas auctions that I mentioned during the talk. But definitely, if there is more money on the table, then probably also miners at some point um, will do more front-running over there. And there was also this interesting paper by Phil Dane who mentioned hey, actually, this could actually have some impacts on the consensus mechanisms later on. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, Arin, you're afraid of the fragmentation of the coins. So having an exchange with multiple coins, uh, there might be a situation in which there is no offer or no demand. So, for example, people are offering, uh, uh, asking for a certain price for coins, uh, from coin X to coin Z, when there is no, no actually demand for that. I don't know if... Uh, Sorry, like now I'm standing better, now I'm hearing the questions better. You have to help me out one more time. Yeah, you actually showed the graph before, where you see all the, exchange, all the possible exchanges. Like, if I, in the ring structure, can I, can I have, for example, have uh, uh, A, token A, B, C, and D, and uh, exchange them freely from A to B, from A to C, to, uh, from A to D, right? Yes, if, if they are basically limit orders that are connecting these tokens, and if we can find prices that basically met all these criteria, yeah. then definitely we yeah, can connect exactly. them. Exactly, like, aren't you afraid of this limitation? Like, uh, if uh, I have enough uh, people that wants to buy and sell this pair? Yes. Yeah, actually, I mean, uh, I, do, you do you think this is a problem or not really? 
So I think, especially for these stable coins and so on, we have kind of the, this fragmented market because usually, um, and if you are looking at all the other markets, we have dominant currencies. Let it be Ether, let it be US dollars, others and so on. But over there in the stablecoin market currently, we see uh, actually there is not really a, a dominant one. And then, hey, how does the situation now change if you don't have dominant um, currencies? And we think with our mechanism, we actually found a good way to, to tackle that. Uh, thank you for the talk. Um, as far as I know, that auto bookmarking is uh, consumes pretty uh, a lot of computing and also uh, storage in the uh, on the chain. So, how uh, usually do people try to solve it? So that's a really good question. Um, we have the cool mechanism that is very decentralized, and basically it works like that: that the basically on the blockchain the problem will be well defined after the batch auction closes then people can start calculating these prices, and then they're basically giving bits. And these bits are basically stating, hey, I'm able to find prices that match disinterest trading volume. And then others come in, but okay, I'm able to find prices that match disinterest trading volume. And then we will basically um, not, we will get the maximum by people who are basically in a competition and only the maximum value for the trading volume will then be accepted. And with that, yeah, we are solving the optimization problem in a very decentralized way, I would say. And the cool thing about it is that on the blockchain, we only have to verify all the different constraints, but not actually finding the solution. Hi there. Um, you mentioned that uh, this proof of concept is going to use stable coins. Is there any particular reason you chose to go with stable coins as a proof of concept? Yes. Um, good questions. Definitely, we will at the beginning focus on stable coins, but later on, we are for sure want, we for sure want to add more coins, um, also more volatile ones. But we think that this market mechanism will work especially well with stable coins because. Um, these batch auctions, they are a little bit slower from the finality point of view, from the settlement. And basically, if you have crazy volatile tokens that go up with the price, uh, with the price up and down fairly quickly, this, is, this might be a small drawback. And so we said, okay, let's first focus really on these stable coins. Over there, we don't have these crazy fluctuations. And then actually, the slow finality is not a big disadvantage. All right.